Hello, welcome, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Kandil Javed. I'm the co-director of Muslims for Progressive Values Boston. Um, and before we get started, just like our tradition, I'm going to go ahead and take the pledge for our hashtag No Hate in My Faith campaign. Um, I pledge to refute and combat discrimination against any individual or community, including Blacks, the LGBTQ plus community, women, Jews, Shia, Sunni, Ahmadi Muslims, Bahia, non-Muslim, atheist, or any other, no matter what that other is. I pledge to eradicate all divisive, homophobic, and misogynistic teachings in my community and in my religious institutions. I'm affiliated with and will affirm the dignity of all individuals. With that, I would like to give a disclaimer that the content that we're going to share in this um, conversation is not to offend anyone, rather to show support for folks in our progressive Muslim communities and Muslim communities in general. Uh, the conversation might not be suitable for children, and we would like to give you a uh, trigger warning uh, before starting this conversation, as the topic of today's conversation is um, mental health issues, and in particular, suicide among uh, American Muslims. So, on Sunday, June 14th, Sarah Hirazi, a 30-year-old Egyptian queer feminist whose resistance centered around a reconstruction of class, power, and struggle, took her own life in exile in Canada. Her courage, her writing, her bravery of challenges, the heteronormative society are remarkable. We dedicate this conversation to Sarah with love, peace, and compassion. And today we have a great speaker with us, um, um, Emilia Noor Oshiro, is a PhD student uh, in her third year at John Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. Her dissertation focuses on understanding risk and protective factors of suicide among early adult American Muslims. Using a community-based participatory approach. Her previous training includes a postdoctoral fellowship in trauma and violence, research of the National Institute of Health, as well as master's in public health and certification in the social determinant of health from Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health. She provides critical analysis of issues affecting marginalized populations that lived through, and, and, and sorry, uh, population through a lived experience and perspective, which is fortified by her credentialed professional background. Muslims around uh, uh, make around 1% of the US population and obtaining statistics around a group that is so small in number uh, is often very challenging. And in this conversation, we want to kind of figure out what is the initiative behind the project that she has been lead, uh, leading. Um, so Noor, welcome to the, the, this conversation with Muslims for Progressive Values. Can you tell us a little bit about the Muslim Suicide Project, please? Absolutely, thank you, Kandil, for having me. And I'm so glad that you reached out to me um, in regard to Sarah and her activism. And I really was so honored and motivated to be able to speak on this. And <clears throat> I pray that her soul rests in peace. Um, so, I mean, so um, I am very passionate about uh, suicide and particularly suicide in the Muslim community. Uh, you know, just dating back to give you a little bit of history, um, Muslims are a fairly new group to the United States when it comes to those of us who are immigrants. Of course, we've had Muslims since, you know, slavery um, has existed where we know of West Africans coming here um, before the country was even founded. And most of the Muslims here in the U.S. today are 
uh, first, second, or third generation immigrants. Um, the majority are first and second generation. So what that means is first generation means you were born somewhere else and you came here. Uh, and second generation is you're born here in the United States and you have parents uh, or just one parent who was born somewhere else. And so why do I talk about immigrants um, in the context of Muslim suicide research? Because immigrants have a very unique set of stressors. And in terms of how to understand Muslims, uh, a lot of the time we talk about Muslims as a faith group and we kind of frame the conversation around, you know, aspects of, um, you know, us being socially Muslim and have this kind of social identity as a faith group. And I'd like to kind of reframe that a little bit to focus more on um, the fact that we are minorities as uh, most of us are racial minorities and have immigrant backgrounds or have some kind of minority related um, identity and when you compound that with the fact that you know you could identify as queer, um, then you have several minority identities, and we can get on that later. So essentially, when you know the research um, world looks at things like mental health and suicide, and we try to understand exactly how to conceptualize, you know, what are the risk factors, what is contributing to poor mental health, uh, we really want to look at things like what are the stressors. Stress is a huge component of any kind of mental health issue, any kind of physical health issue. In fact, in the class that I teach, um, I tell my students that if there's anything that you get out of this class, it's just that stress affects your life. Like literally everything goes back to stress. And that is critical because in the Muslim uh, population, in the Muslim demographic in the US right now, we're facing a lot of unique stressors, uh, particularly as it relates to xenophobia and Islamophobia and just in, in terms of racism and uh, misogyny and homophobia and all the other isms, there are plenty of us who have, who experience oppression um, from multiple different angles. And so what's going on right now is uh, we don't have data on Muslim mental health in regards to suicide rates. Um, in regards to mental health rates in general, and I'm particularly talking about rates, which is um, X number of cases uh, per year, uh, it's very hard to get a prevalence to understand like how prevalent is depression or stress, um, excuse me, uh, or anxiety or other clinical diagnoses in the Muslim community. Why? Because we can constitute like 1% of the United States population. We don't have... Uh, you know, we don't have a data set really to, to put it um, in, in kind of concise terms. We don't have like this, you know, we can just go to this one data set, collect statistics and say, okay, this is, you know, how many Muslims in the United States face this issue or that issue, um, or how many, um, you know, uh, have death by suicide compared to people who are non-Muslim or those types of things. So we really have to use kind of proxy variables, which is a, a you know technical terminology to basically say we have to look at stuff that can kind of estimate Muslimness, so to speak. Um, and so that's why I bring up the, the conversation around being immigrant. And I came to this research because, uh, and actually just came to this research a year ago, and it's 2020 now, I started in May 2019, uh, because uh, locally where I go to school here at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health, we had um, within the vicinity of our campus, uh, three Latinx youth suicides happen in the string of three months. And, uh, and that is common, you know, it can, it, it, there's a contagion effect of suicide itself, although it's not a communicable disease, it is uh, in a sense um, contagious in that regard. And so I thought to myself, you know, why are, are what's similar between this group and, um, and Muslims? Well, come, uh, when I came to learn of it, the, one of the stories for the um, people who died in um, our area in Baltimore here, <clears throat> his parents were at risk of deportation. And you know, he had such a strong fear of what would happen to his parents and just this you know, lack of um, certainty and lack of control over their future and his future really, 
uh, that it affected him so deeply and it resulted in his death, despite the fact that he was very socially active, you know, one of the most popular kids at school, it's completely unexpected death, um, you know, which is another common thing that we hear. And, you know, I thought to myself, this is such a kind of a similar parallel to what's going on in the Muslim community right now. There's so much hatred and stigma against the Muslim identity. And, you know, so many of uh, the adolescents in our community right now, the young adults, you know, people who are teenagers or, you know, entering their early 20s, uh, they're experiencing a lot of the same fears in regard to what's going to happen to my family. Am I safe walking out of my home? Um, you know, why can't I have my extended family come visit, you know, or I can't, I'm afraid of going out of the country. You know, other types of things that have similar parallels. And I knew personally of some stories um, of uh, deaths by suicide in our Muslim community. Um, and I have come to learn that this is something that is so not discussed, so not talked about, but it is happening. And when I started this initiative, the Muslim Suicide Researcher on Facebook, um, I was overwhelmed with the number of likes I got within the first 48 hours. It was like 300 people liked the page. And I was not expecting that considering how stigmatized mental health and suicide is in general. Um, and, you know, I was just, <clears throat> I was really motivated that this is something that we actually really need to talk about. Um, I'm very passionate about addressing it. And, you know, if I can save a life um, through research, that's, you know, that would be my honor. I think you touched on some very important points, which is the stigmatization, right? The margin, the more marginalized communities are, the more, um, you know, challenges that they're facing, and that adds on the stress onto the individuals and so on. And Absolutely. Yes. Let and me just speak on that, Kandil, really quick. So... <laughs> So my entire research agenda actually focuses on stigma in particular. Uh, so stigmatized identity is extremely important to understand because what happens with stigma, it actually in, in <clears throat> public health research, it's been evidenced that stigma is a fundamental cause for health disparities. So when we talk about health disparities, what does that even mean? It means that people have, you know, you're expected to live, what, 85-ish years, depending on, you know, whether you identify as male or female. And, and there's differences by race um, around that. But, um, you know, the disparity factor of it is how many years of your life are you losing simply because of a minority status? And so being racially a minority, for example, um, uh, African American men and African American women have differences in their lifespan uh, because of their racial minority status being not privileged and stigmatized um, and being discriminated. And so, and that lifespan basically can actually span up to 20 years less. So it's it's really considerable. It's a, it's an entire generation. I mean, imagine, you know, knowing that you wouldn't be able to see your grandchildren being born, you know? So just to put things in perspective, and in terms of stigmatized identity, um, there is a researcher, Mark Hatzenbuehler, <clears throat> who helped, um, who, um, who was a mentor of mine at Columbia and helped me kind of conceptualize my research on Muslim mental health. And his research really looks into the concept of stigmatized identity for queer people. And what he found is that there are higher rates of suicide deaths um, based on being a non-heteronormative sexual orientation uh, compared to being straight. And this happens as early as teenage years. And so he's really been kind of like the, one of the most formative researchers um, uh, right now that has really kind of shifted the notion of um, being a minority and really understanding how the stigma can actually cause people's lifespans to shorten uh, <clears throat> in terms of the health disparities understanding. So it's, it's not just, you know, oh, we have stigma against our identity. It's actually fundamentally causing every stress that we experience. Very crucial and important, and thanks for thanks for highlighting that and providing us with the details of that. I mean, uh, just being an advocate for Muslim LGBT community and progressive Muslim community, I have seen folks um, 
you know, de dealing with mental, um, uh, mental health issues. And at some point, uh, those mental health issues have, you know, they, they, they've shared the fact that they at some point in their lives have had suicidal thoughts. So it is very important. However, I think a very important point here is that um, as a researcher, uh, it must be really challenging to obtain this data. And what are some, so can you tell us like some of the challenges that you face while collecting data um, in terms of uh, suicide among American Muslims? Yeah, so I would love to collect data on this so that we could actually start really putting numbers into our advocacy and really kind of shifting it into policy change, which is the ultimate goal of why I am in research is for it to ultimately, you know, shape and influence policy. Uh, the challenge is we are, <clears throat> um, the, 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 the data points are just not there. So for example, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest collection of uh, data on the United States population is the U.S. Census. And uh, there's a number of other surveys that are out there in terms of health surveys that are collected at, at a national basis and have thousands and thousands of um, people in their sample size. but. <clears throat> in terms of really collecting the specific identity of Muslim, that is very challenging. Now, there is a U.S. Census um, questionnaire, uh, or sorry, there was, a, there was a survey of how many faith groups and how many members are in that faith group under the U.S. Census. And so that's how we get, have this estimate, um, which is more really a guesstimate than an estimate. It's like an educated um, guess of uh, just how many Muslims there are in the United States. But the challenge is, you know, we are, uh, we are very community based, which is to say that, you know, we don't just have, um, you know, we have very pockets of populations across the United States. So it's very hard to systematically um, collect and randomly collect people uh, in, in a systematic way to make it representative of the entire Muslim population. So that's, basically saying that if we come up with a rate uh, of, you know, how many um, deaths per year are by suicide in the Muslim community, we could have a huge margin of error around that because we don't know if the people we sampled are just from one small community or there's other larger communities. And so how do we find them out? I mean, the Muslim population is rapidly growing across the world, um, and that includes the United States. And, you know, what, what if in the 10 years of taking the census, um, you know, we've, we've had so many more new communities and those communities are not counted in the, you know, in, uh, across the years. So there's that challenge. And then there's a the challenge that we're not collecting information beyond, you know, um, that are, sorry, we're not collecting information that's specific to Muslims. So we may want to ask things like, you know, um, can you describe uh, your visibility as a Muslim? Like, you know, do you wear, and is there any kind of garb that you wear that would indicate um, your status or, or identification as a Muslim, which could be helpful in kind of uh, gauging other types of relationships to mental health, which is actually the research that I did before. And other types of unique cultural and religious factors that pertain to the Muslim identity. So it ultimately comes down to we really need our own data sets. And unfortunately, we just don't have the funding to um, really support <clears throat> huge, expansive um, research. Well, this, was, this will take like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not in the millions, to really con conduct like a really thorough um, research project. So we can, what we really work off of is just community studies, a whole bunch of them, and we jumble them together. And I'll just kind of throw this in. Um, if you're interested in funding my research, um, I will share with you the, um, uh, the link or the, the hashtag, whatever they call it, to, to support my research, because we really have to rely on um, outside funding to support this. And just as a kind of tangent, I don't know if you know Kandil, but um, talking about health disparities, it's a very political conversation. So when I talk about that, I'm saying that there are only certain groups that actually can count towards being a health disparity population. And right now, faith groups are not classified under those. Um, and so, you, you know, the, 
the government recognizes that you know racial minorities um, and uh, and you know people <clears throat> of other minority status um, can be considered disparity populations, which means there's special funding actually allocated to do research for them. And um, LGBTQ population actually got that status um, within the last 10 years, which is very very recent. Um, and people who are disabled are gonna are kind of on the cusp of that status as well. But for faith groups to be assigned that status is a long time coming, if ever. And so if you really care about getting this type of data, you have to fund that research. So, you know, that's kind of my little shout out to everyone out there who really cares about this work as much as I do and would want to support this kind of work. Absolutely, and, uh, and I don't know if anybody else who is conducting this research um, or this level of research, and we're going to share the link of, 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 of um, your, your page directly right under this video. So if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, please check out that link right under this video on YouTube or Facebook. Um, with that, I think um, oftentimes a lot of people ask me, what is the number of LGBT Muslims? Or what is the number of LGBT identified Muslims in the, in the US and so on and, and oftentimes, and most of the times I actually don't even have an answer because there is no evaluation scale, right? There is, um, you know, sexual orientation is a, is a part of you, right? It is um, a part of your identity. It's something, that's how you're born. Um, it's not, and, and then some people, you know, choose to come out early on, whereas some people choose to come out later on in their life depending upon the journey that they're living. And it's so hard to obtain this data. So how could you as a researcher, um, how, how, do you, how can we collect data uh, specific to LGBT Muslims uh, suicide rate? And then uh, maybe you can start off with the mental health illness and then uh, maybe drift and focus towards uh, suicide because that's, that's the topic that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Well, the first step is just to identify where those people are and how we can access them. Um, part of the real big challenge is because the identity of being a queer Muslim is so stigmatized and not just stigmatized, it's completely unwelcome um, in the community, in the broader Muslim community. And even I would say, of course, the American community at large, um, the challenge is really to have a forum where people actually feel safe enough to um, disclose their identity. And that brings a lot of challenges to even collecting the data alone and then making inferences on that data. Because again, are we getting a representative sample or are we only getting the people who feel comfortable enough to disclose this information? And then are we even getting people in the right spots? Are we sampling in the right places? Like, are we going to the hangout spots um, that, you know, that's it for the in-group, you know, that only people who are in or identify as queer Muslims um, actually go to or know about, right? So <clears throat> these are all sampling questions. This is like all about how we do the method of sampling, um, which is critical because if we don't know how to find the folks, then we won't know how to analyze the folks and how to then help the folks and intervene, right? So um, it's very much a similar conversation as just Muslims uh, broadly, but uh, it obviously adds another layer of, you know, um, carefulness that we have to really approach the topic with because if we, you know, sample people from one community and then say, well, here's the rate, um, we could really shape interventions based off of that and then fail miserably. And that's not what we want to do. So, and that's that's the history of public health research, especially when it comes to community-based work. It's very challenging to do this. So, um, what I have found, and what um, other researchers do to really help kind of mitigate some of these issues around safety, around comfort, um, is to really use online surveys and collect data online. But again, you're not necessarily getting a representative sample across age groups. And so you mentioned that, you know, some people may uh, begin to identify or come out um, or have kind of more of a fluid understanding of their identity um, later on in life and, and you know, revisit that identity. Uh, regardless, 
right now the demographic that's online is under 30. So if you look at like Pew Research, I believe the statistic is like somewhere in the like 97 or 98 percent of um, all people who are under 30 are online. And that drops very um, considerably for each decade um, in the age group. So, you know, if you're trying to get people who are in their midlife, you know, 40s, 50s, um, you may not be able to access them online. So then what if they are an extremely vulnerable group in the sense that, you know, um, that is a very, uh, you know, critical time for um, suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts. What if we're missing them because the mode that we're getting them through, which is online, is not accessible or is not their preferred mode to um, communicate or to do a survey. So there's a bunch of research challenges and you know the best thing to do is just to simply go into the community and ask them where do they feel um, most comfortable getting this data where should we you know help them guide us um, and that's where the community-based participatory approach really comes in is that you know the power and the 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 ball so to speak in the in the court is on the community side to tell us where to go and for us to do the work that they really want Absolutely. I think um, you touched on a very important point, which is not only stigmatization, but the unwelcomeness into a community and how that could potentially lead into, um, along with other factors, you know, one feeling um, or adding on to their stressors and stuff like that. Being a, being a gay Muslim, I mean, I can, I can say that um, having to live in a community where I wasn't welcomed for a long time was a very stressful time. You know, my uh, anxiety and depression was at very, um, you know, was, was very high at that time. And I think it took, it took years for me to transition and, and find the space where I feel welcomed. And now I see, and I'm, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm happy and healthy. And uh, those, those, those peaks have come down, right, for anxiety and depression. So I think that is so very important uh, when we talk about mental health issues to find spaces where LGBT Muslims feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, I would like to ask, like, what's the importance of this research initiative that you are doing um, for American Muslims? Like, what is, uh, where do you see this leading into in the future? Absolutely. So what's my agenda? Um, so, you know, I, I came into this work just generally being very passionate about Muslim mental health. And um, my original project was looking at whether there were gender differences in anxiety and depressive symptoms uh, based on um, displaying Islamic garb, so being a visible Muslim. And that eventually funneled into just overall um, you know, uh, looking at intersectional aspects of the Muslim experience, like, you know, um, your, your race and how visible you are racially and, you know, um, along with your Muslim identity and your gender and all these intersections. And <clears throat> I came to realize that as I was doing this and as I, I actually started um, a group online, a support group online called Muslim, um, uh, or sorry, it's called Women and Non-Binary Muslims Conquer Grad School. And um, that group essentially now has like over a thousand people and it's, it has like grad students all across the United States and internationally. And I started getting a glimpse of what are people's projects and what are people's ideas. And as I entered my PhD program um, three years ago, you know, I realized that everyone is doing like an extension of each other's ideas. And so I was like, okay, well, <laughs> there's all these ideas, but no one's talking about suicide. Like either it's like no one really wants to, or maybe it's just too much. Like it's a lot to handle. Like I actually had to go through a lot of therapy myself to be able to even be there for the community to do this stuff. And mind you, I'm only doing this as a researcher, like behind a screen, you know? Um, but as I've become a candidate now and I'm going to start doing my own research, um, you know, in the coming months, I actually am going to be talking to people one on one and collecting interview data and hearing straight from the voices and mouths of the community. And <clears throat> I'm going to have to really be prepared and have the skills to talk about this very sensitive subject. 
And what's the point of doing this? I mean, I talked about, you know, yeah, we want to shape policy, but where does that policy really count? Of course, it'll be great to have that at a national level, um, like, you know, change federal governance and, um, you know, local governance. That would be amazing. And I don't know how close we are to actually doing that. I think there's a lot more conversations that would have to happen over the years. And I'm not sure how optimistic I am about all of that happening in the next few years, which is another reason why I'm doing this research. Um, but I actually really am passionate about bringing this information, again, locally back to the community. You know, I have been a very active and vocal member of the different Muslim communities um, I've been a part of across the United States. You know, I grew up in Southern California in Los Angeles, Orange County, um, you know, had some time spent in the Bay Area in California, then in St. Louis, Missouri, in um, New York, New York. And now I'm in Baltimore, you know, I have my sister out in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've really gotten a glimpse of how Muslim communities understand um, social issues. And, you know, it's like actually very similar across the board. Um, you know, it's, it's sad actually how similar Muslim communities are across the board. There's such a lack of kind of integrated diversity is what I would call it, in, you know, in terms of understanding age diversity in the mosques, racial diversity, immigrant background versus being third generation or, you know, all these types of things that really influence the policies at the masjid. And I'll give you one really solid reason why I want to do this work and, and what I expect to do, get from it. Um, let me share a very important story with you, Kunzio. So about a year ago, I actually um, was talking to um, one of the administrators slash executives at a masjid out in Southern California. And I was trying to organize with them um, a, a discussion around trauma, around, race, around intergenerational trauma. And the conversation was only going to be about that. Um, and it was only going to be about how we need to focus on, you know, really healing ourselves from you know, um, multiple generations worth of abuse and violence and that kind of stuff. And um, it turns out that, you know, I had already actually, um, they had already paid for a flight for me to come out. They were in the process of um, finalizing the, the details for the poster. The date was already set. Um, you know, those types of things were already done. And I got a random call one day um, from, from that administrator saying, um, you know, one of the members of our congregation actually saw you at the Muslim Mental Health Conference um, a few months ago, and we just want to give you an, a, a chance to really speak for yourself on what you shared at that conference. And I was like, what are you talking about? And uh, they were like, well, you said that the masjid should have a sign on their door that says we welcome all people of all backgrounds, including people of different sexual orientations. And, um, and I said, yeah, that's exactly what I said. And they're like, I basically got a text message um, a few days later saying that the board decided not to host me as a speaker uh, because of something as simple as that, that I just suggested to have this kind of inclusive signage um, in the masjid. And, uh, and by the way, this was in the context of, of a talk that I gave at that conference, which is an academic conference, by the way. Um, and the context of the whole talk was about social justice and, you know, how we should really understand how stigma functions in um, suicide. And so I was actually talking exactly about what I talked about right now with you and had slides and everything. And um, even, you know, it was just like such an ordeal that I, I could not believe it. I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated that, you know, this is the state of where our community is at. And I really held out hope because that particular administrator and I seem to have been on, on such a strong wavelength together um, up to that point. And then it was just boom, <laughs> boom, like this is, um, this is where we're at. And so I recognize how much work there is left to do in the Muslim community and, and part of the passion I have in trying not to just stay in the academic ivory tower and just publish, you know, articles and, and journals that no one in the Muslim community is ever really going to read or have access to. 
um, the whole point is to start these other avenues like social media, like Facebook, like YouTube, like my YouTube videos. Um, conversations like this, where I have with you, wonderful, wonderful people like you, um, to really get this word out there and, and get an audience so that we can change the social norms around who is accepted at the masjid and who is accepted in the Muslim community. Um, rejection is very, very quickly internalized. And that is at the core issue of not just queer Muslims, but just in general, humankind. And of course, for Muslims right now, being rejected is something that we're feeling at a broad community level in the United States. So if we understand the, the plight of rejection, why is it so difficult for us to understand that, you know, people who are, um, you know, non-normative with sexual orientation or gender um, identity experience the same stigma as we do? I mean, at, at, a, at a core level is what I'm talking about. So why is that so difficult? And if I just had some data to really bring, you know, some substance to the lived experiences that people are already sharing, maybe that could be a point to convince people. And I am so thankful right now that you're here and you're saying it just to hear this, you know, um, for, you know, it coming from another Muslim sister, like, you know, that, that they care about the rainbow identities within the different sexual orientations within within the muslim community it means the world to me and trust me i i am I'm, I'm, I'm just it, it just warms me up when i hear this coming because in all reality i do advocacy work and i you know my job is to to um it's not my job but my volunteer work is to to reach out to to muslim communities and 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 you know welcome them to this progressive space that we have and a lot of times, believe it or not, um, most Muslims don't even want to talk about it, right? Oh, yeah. And um, and that includes, of course, some people that are very, you know, blood related and close to me, um, don't want to even talk about it, engage in the conversation. The reality is what you just mentioned that you know, being marginalized, we are we are seeing, especially within last five six years, it has like dramatically increased under you know the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, to see how, how we feel of being marginalized. Now, for a second, I want people to think, how would you feel if you're marginalized from the outside? Because when we go into the outside world, when we go into the LGBT um, spaces and communities, and um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are marginalized as being the Muslim, right? I am, I'm, 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 I am who I am, and I'm not changing it for anybody else, right? It's a part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the Muslim spaces and we are like, oh my God, the untouchables, right? Don't touch them, don't talk to them. They're gonna like change this and all that stuff. So I am so thankful to you for even highlighting this and bringing this up. And I'm um, just gonna share a quick example, which is when we started the community here in the Boston area, it was 18 people. And as of today, we have 245 members in this community. Amazing. In Amazing. two years, Mashallah. our goals are to make this space welcome all Muslims. Right. They're married out of race, out of religion, they're still a Muslim. They're still a part of our community. We welcome them, regardless of their sexual orientation, their gender. They could lead the prayer, stand where they want to be, where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And and we are all in it in this beautiful space on a spiritual journey, on a religious journey, on an Islamic journey. And it just makes things um, so beautiful that I have learned how privileged I was for all these years being a man, being a male, and I didn't think about various things that were happening in my surroundings. I was just so ignorant to see that, you know, so-and-so that I know got like an 18-year-old uh, cousin of mine or 19 years got, got engaged to like a 24, five-year-old man. And I didn't speak up because I... I, I I was so ignorant and I wasn't educated about it and I it just didn't it just didn't um, I guess it, it didn't have an impact on me and now coming into this space where I really understand what it what it feels like to be marginalized I'm starting to care more about everything else to, to make it a safe space for people around me 
So with that, I, I do want to ask you, what is, um, what is the focus of this amazing research initiative that you have? I mean, you're going into various spaces. It looks like you're doing what, what we call in the human rights term, um, grassroots work, which is going into the community, talking to the people, very effective way to kind of know them. At the same time, you're collecting data, which is very statistics driven, uh, quantitative. So you're doing uh, qualitative data, which is or qualitative approach, which is online. You're reaching out, you're sharing videos, going into the grassroots, going into the communities. And then you also are in need for the real statistics that we cannot obtain online. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the, the initiative, which focus groups you're looking at and so on? Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> I actually have a completely non-traditional approach to research, and it is actually not focused on quantitative approaches and statistics. Um, I appreciate statistics and I value its, its role and place. Uh, I don't think statistics will be effective for us at the stage of research we're at now for the Muslim community. I think that once we have enough data, yes, yeah, statistics will be useful um, to give us snapshots and trends and, and really give us kind of big picture stuff. But I think right now we're really starting at square one. Um, I think we're really starting at, we need to figure out the etiology, the causal factors. What would even make someone consider suicide? We don't even know something as basic as that. So then how are we going to come up with the risk factors that are particular to the Muslim community, you know? Um, yeah, we have, you know, the general risk factors, uh, which are, you know, um, you have, you know someone um, who is in your family or social circle or friend circle um, who has died by suicide. That is a risk factor. You know, another risk factor is, you know, experiencing anxiety or depression clinically. Um, Another one is a previous suicide attempt. Um, you know, you know, sometimes stress can actually be uh, an acute risk factor, but it's also like a general risk factor in general. Um, and for, for the research I do in particular, stigma and discrimination, uh, or really the perception of discrimination, the perception of stigma against, uh, from, against your identity from other people is a huge risk factor. Um, so, but we really don't know specifically from the mouths, like I said, from the voices of the people, right? This is like a very social justice thing that I um, root my research in. In fact, uh, the, the kind of epistemology or epistemological approaches that I take in terms of understanding um, how to value knowledge and where knowledge comes from for our research is the word perfectly described grassroots. And um, the way we conceptualize that in research is the community-based uh, participatory approach, which is to say that I'm not gonna sit behind a computer and come up with questions that I think matter to the community or that I think the questions um, you know, could be important for the community to kind of understand. I'm actually gonna go to the community and ask them what are their thoughts in general around this topic and then come up with questions with them, like literally with them, come up with questions that they think are important to ask, because that's the only way I'm gonna get data that's effective, um, that's actually gonna mean something. And so the approach that I actually take from the community-based uh, lens is called phenomenology. And um, what that means is essentially I ask people about their lived experiences. So I actually get stories and narratives from people, um, kind of like how you shared earlier with your own narrative, right? Um, and I would essentially uh, capture that um, in my research and analyze that as a data source and then come up with um, codes to kind of standardize what you, what you shared and standardize it across the different interviews that I would do with people. And why is that important? Because I'm dealing with human beings and I'm dealing with human issues and I'm dealing with human perspectives and social perspectives, really. You know, what really distinguishes us um, as humans is, is how social we are and the level of social intelligence and emotional intelligence that we have. And, you know, so much of that needs to be captured in science. And believe it or not, that is who I am. I'm a social scientist. I'm a research scientist uh, with a specific focus on social and behavioral um, science. So you know that is to say that i study how people 
uh, interact and, and what informs their behavior and what influences their thought processes so that I can then influence their behavior later on with an intervention. So essentially, if someone shares with me during a focus group or during a one-on-one uh, -on -one interview uh, that says that, you know, stress is a major reason why I have, you know, negative thoughts. And, you know, then I would ask something about, you know, well, what's, what is it about the stress? What's the nature of the stress? What's behind the stress? What's causing the stress? Where are the sources of that stress? And then I would just go deeper and deeper and deeper and um, essentially be able to code that. So that's really what my research is about, is stress, uh, oppression. Um, a lot of what I do comes from the framework of, you know, understanding how experience of violence, trauma, abuse um, are, uh, you know, contextualizing the stress that we experience. And these aren't just, you know, trauma, violence, abuse at like a one-on-one -on -one personal level. This is like violence and trauma that we experience in our community and our country in the world. So there's several like ecological layers to this um, that each kind of, you know, are nested within each other. And it's so important to really kind of understand how those not only interact with each other, but can compound each other and result in the type of plethora of mental health issues that we have um, in our community. So it's a matter of trying to identify that and then come up with some kind of suicide prevention program. And that is ultimately the long-term goal, you know, is to really be able to conceptualize this data in a way that is meaningful and can actually result in change and, and save people's lives, inshallah. Inshallah, absolutely. And with that, I think we're going to, uh, so we reached out to the community leaders of Muslims for Progressive Values, and we asked for comments, questions, and concerns, um, you know, from a research standpoint for you. And uh, the, of course, we can't cover everybody's questions, but we would love to in the future, if there is any, feel free to reach out to, to our, um, through our website. Mm -hmm. And the question that I have here that I would like you to kind of briefly give us, um, or maybe give, give us a high level answer for is, what are some of the signs of suicide that family members should monitor for their LGBT plus Muslim family members? And how can they show support? that okay so this kind of falls more under the realm of like clinical um uh you know clinical credentials but i can try to cover that again from like a more 40 foot thousand view point yeah. um, <clears throat> the number one thing is you need to understand that suicide can actually happen at any time um, a lot of us kind of anticipate that suicide is like a buildup of events. And yes, that can be the case. But sometimes people without mental health conditions can actually just um, choose to, you know, uh, execute their plan or even just execute the death just by itself without a plan. So one of the more um, critical states to really understand is if the person is at a point where they have a plan. So if they have a plan, that is a time to, you know, really get the crisis hotline um, number and call them, call 911 um, if you need to, if you really are concerned. Um, although, you know, there's considerations around that for the Muslim community and getting law enforcement involved. So really the critical thing is to just have the numbers for therapists, um, for the crisis hotlines, the local ones at hand. Um, to research on your own, what are some of these warning signs, particular to um, LGBT groups? Um, you know, I, that is not my specialty or, or my research area, so I, I hesitate to really give a more comprehensive answer on that. And I'll just add that, you know, it's really important to provide an accepting environment, a supportive environment. That is the number one thing that would be, um, I think, very essential for someone who identifies as LGBTQ+, because that's something that alone, just alone, you know, social support in general, uh, and not just for queer Muslims or anybody um, of a minority identity, social support is the number one buffer for mental health issues across the board, like across the board. And what are good measures of social support? I mean, do you have someone you can text if you want to hang out tonight? Do you have someone you could call if you get sick and you need to pick up medication? These are indicators of social support. You know, do you have friends? Do you have at least one friend you can really count on? And you know, the majority of Americans are actually struggling with social support, especially the elderly. 
Um, so this is actually kind of an epidemic in and of itself, the level of isolation that comes with being queer because you are stigmatized um, and because you are uh, kind of otherized and essentially uh, quarantined really for lack of a better word um, in your own experience that, you know, your isolation can, can, inc can quickly escalate those kind of um, cognitive processes that are negative, right? Like you can be stuck within the four walls. And I think a lot of us at this point with COVID have experienced what social isolation can do mentally. Um, and to just imagine that the cause of that is because people hate you or reject you um, to bring a kind of lived experience perspective to that. So I hope that people kind of understand how important social isolation is. So to really combat that with social support, really kind of add that social support, um, make sure that there isn't any kind of plan in place. Um, something as simple as asking, are you having thoughts of harming yourself or killing yourself? That's a, a screening question. It's legit a screening question that, that we use on health surveys um, to assess whether someone is having suicidal ideation. So those are kind of the small things. Right, that's, uh, that's actually a great, great um, idea that you gave us there. So with that, I think I'm gonna touch upon some of the comments that we have from our um, MPV leaders. Uh, we have a comment here. I think the American, Muslim American community, to a certain extent, doesn't have the best track record in dealing with issues regarding mental health. I'm not talking about the people suffering from mental health related troubles, but rather the ones around them. People, especially LGBTQ plus youth, tend to end up suffering far longer than they should because of a lack of support or understanding from those around them. Certainly, this is not the case in every situation, but it seems to be far more common than perhaps in one faith-based community, American community. And then we have some concerns that were shared. Um, some folks shared that I heard this at a khutbah in Dallas last year. Muslims cannot have mental, mental health problems. It is the invention of white people to deceive us. Um, we have another comment. I have from many whose issues were dismissed for either one, jinn affecting them, two, they have sinned and Allah is punishing them, and three, they're drama queens. Uh, this rhetoric and methodology doesn't help in many cases. It makes it worse. So those are some of the comments and questions that we have from our community members and community leaders. And with that, I think I, um, uh, you know, we touched upon a lot of different things. Again, uh, we have Amelia, you know, who has shared a lot of great ways that this research initiative is uh, picking up in upcoming near future. So if you would like to know more about it and um, uh, would like to support her her work, please uh, click, it, click the link below this video and you can get in contact with her. She also has a page which is called the, um, is it called the, the Muslim Suicide Research Project? Researcher. Mm -hmm. The Muslim Suicide Researcher. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, and you can check that out too with uh, some great videos that she has shared in terms of, um, you know, the research work that she's doing and the various um, um, aspects of that research. And with that, I would, I would like to say thank you so much for being here. We know that time is very important for you right now and you're very busy and thank you for taking out time and being here. Just your work speaks for itself. It speaks the volumes, not only that you're doing research behind screen, but you're going into communities like ours um, and, and actually uh, caring about the most uh, vulnerable folks uh, in, in, you know, um, in our community and, and, and the ones that need most help for, um, because of uh, oppression and various marginalization within our community. So I really wanna thank you, Amelia, for, for doing um, all that you do, and um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Absolutely, and to the leaders of MPV, thank you for having me, and let me just add one final comment that um, we all face mental health issues because we all have stress in our lives. 
<laughs> so it's, it's a universal issue. And whether we call it mental health or stress, they're one and the same. So inshallah, we can figure out how to really frame this conversation in the community sometime soon. Inshallah, I mean, and um, definitely. And I hope that there is, we have about eight chapters all across the US, um, seven chapters and a few plus communities. And um, I hope that people participate in yeah. research that you have coming up in near future or in far future. And we're hoping to keep this, um, the, this initiative moving because it is so important in our, in our communities. With that, I would like to end today's conversation because it is dedicated to Sarah Higazi. I would like to share a message that we have from Sarah. Mm -hmm. My name is Sarah Higazi. I'm gone, not forgotten. While many say that I took my own life, I didn't. It's your, converse, it's your conservative laws that took my life. It's my family who took, took it. It's my own people who killed me. It, they killed me in the name of honor. They killed me in the name of faith. They, they killed me because I was truthful. They killed me because their belief was blind. You didn't see my pain. All you saw was my attraction to the same gender. I had, no commi I had not committed a single crime in my life. I only spoke the truth. I was an innocent girl, a girl from Egypt, who happens to be a lesbian, made by the same Allah that made you. The only difference between you and me is the colors I saw. Colors that you did not see. The colors of rainbow. The colors of love and compassion. The colors of truth, justice, and equality. I want you to remember my name when you tell another Arab girl you can be gay and Muslim. I want you to remember my face you when you make a video to humiliate gay Muslims. I want you to remember my name when you write the homophobic comments and blame your religion. I want you to see my work whenever you decide to oppress your mother, your sister, your wife, your friends. I want, I want you to know I was autistic before you encourage your kids to bully. I want you to see my isolation when you corner your family members who are different from you. I want you to think of time, my time in jail when you defend procedures that punish me for being me. I want you to see and remember my name when you pray and I want you to know that you were harsh to me, but I forgive you because that's who I am. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I wish you all stay safe and sound. Um, take care, and assalamu alaikum.